Hello, this webcast is part of our series on urban gardening. And here today with me is Dr. Andreas Wesner. He's a senior lecturer at Lincoln University and his focus is very much on urban design and the interplay between social, political and economic processes and also the, the physical built environment. Andreas, it's really great to meet you and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Andreas, in a, in a recent publication, you look at factors that support or obstruct the development of urban community gardens. And you also mentioned the difference between space and placemaking. Would you maybe first explain what that terminology means and specifically how it relates to urban gardening? Yeah, uh, in order to go to um, placemaking, maybe a few words first about the difference between space and place. So this has been a discussion, I don't know, it started somewhere in the 1960s um, and 70s, uh, coming from cultural geographies, really, there are a couple of authors like um, Ralph, Tewan, Jackson, Seaman, they were quite active in this area. And they looked um, uh, from a phenomenological perspective at the difference between space, which usually refers to the sort of, sort of physical material dimension, the uh, Euclidean space, uh, as we know it, uh, whereas place has often been more connected to um, what we make out of spaces in a, in a sort of emotional subjective way. So place, if you want to, is um, space with, a, with an assigned meaning, uh, values, um, experiences related to a particular sp um, space. So it is, um, it is basically what we call a social construct place. It is, it is not just the, the physical material um, space, empty space. Um, uh, coming to placemaking, then um, there uh, there have been um, um, processes in the literature and and also in practice uh, which look at the transition from space to place. So if we see space as this physical kind of construct and place as a more kind of um, emotionally attached social construct, construct um, it takes a while to make this transition from. Um, space to place. Um, so it's um, it's basically an emotional bond which is built up over time. And this process is, is sometimes called um, placemaking. So now uh, in, in within placemaking there are different dimensions and there's, um, there's a whole theoretical framework around that. Um, and there is also a practical dimension. So there are um, groups of people um, activists, um, organizations like the PPS, the Project for Public Spaces, that um, deal very actively with this process, with this transition process to to create places, not spaces, but um, <clears throat> but places. And coming back to community gardens and, and my my research topic um, here, um, community gardens really can be or could be regarded as a place making scheme because there are um, people coming together, um, sometimes they don't know each other, so diverse people from different communities come together, they create something together, they um, bring in their own values and perspective, and uh, bit by bit, there, um, or hopefully, <laughs> there's a sort of shared experience, a shared social space, shared values, shared goals that develop in such um places like community gardens. And that's why we thought it is a really valuable um, uh, location to observe these space to place uh, transformations. And that was the beginning of, um, of that, um, that research project really. So with the, the context of the social, cultural and uh, economic factors, the, this place making framework, what did you find uh, mm. as, as important barriers or enablers uh, for mm. the development of uh, community gardens. Yeah, so that was really our main research question. I mean, we really wanted to see what are the main, the most important barriers and enablers. And what we found, and um, maybe I should say if, very shortly about how that study was, um, was constructed, or was designed. Um, so we looked at the literature and we did um, we did interviews in uh, with you know 30 different 
um, people in a, in a whole range of different community gardens and also uh, with other organizations in Germany and in New Zealand. And um, and we wanted really to to know what these these people and what the literature actually considers as important barriers and enablers. Um, to this point, barriers and enablers had been almost like incidentally mentioned in the literature, but there was not a single paper that really focused on them as a as a main research topic. So we thought um, this is a, it's a really important topic not only for academic research, but also for community gardeners because, and for, um, for people who um, work with community gardens, who, um, for example, in planning, in city administrations, um, who, uh, who, I mean, part of their job is, is to enable um, those garden projects, for example, and, and find the right spaces for them and, and help gardeners to set up things. So, learning more about what are the factors, um, um, enabling factors or um, obstacles to, to this, we found that was quite an important um, research task. So um, we built it up from the ground, really. We, we, there was no category system for barriers and enablers. So we did it what we call inductively. So we looked really at our our, at our data, we analyzed the data, and from the data, we built up a category system. So that's the opposite of a deductive thing, where you have a, an existing framework, and then you try to fill it with the data you have. Because there wasn't such a framework, we had to we had to basically um, construct our own framework. And one of those uh, main categories, which came up um, with regard to barriers and enablers, um, were social, cultural, and economic um, um, categories. Um, and those turned out to be the most relevant ones and the most um, the ones that were um, most of, often mentioned um, by um, our interview partners, but also in the literature. And within that social, cultural, and economic category, there were um, really two main um, factors that were most um, uh, frequently mentioned. And one of them is the dissemination, sharing of knowledge and skills, which is a driver for the development of gardens. And examples are, for example, teaching how to garden. So the, the skill of gardening, because we found that um, many gardeners complain that is something that gets lost, or uh, there's at least a risk that it's getting lost, and that people actually don't know how to anymore how to garden. So that's an important skill, of course, to keep community gardens running. But also other things like building up technical organizational um, skills, sharing those skills with other people in the garden. Um, but things as well we did not even think about, multilingual training, for example, came up quite a few times because community gardens are sort of melting pots, different people, uh, lots of immig immigrants come in there as well. Um, they bring in their own skills from the home country. They have a different way of, of gardening. They share these skills and really interesting kind of um, shared skill sets develop in these gardens. Education, really important for schools, kindergartens. They're invited to come to um, these gardens and learn something about it. Or things like cooking classes. So you, you basically not only grow the food, but you learn as well the skill set of um, using, let's say, the vegetables to, to cook yourself a meal, which is really important as well for um, um, for community gardens that are in, in, in relative um, deprived um, areas um, in, a, in a city or urban, urban um, area. So all of these things have been really, really important factors, I mean, um, perceived by our, um, by our interviews, but also in the literature as um, as enablers. The lack of it then on the other hand, the absence of knowledge, skills and training was um, very often uh, perceived as detrimental to garden development. Yeah. So we were surprised about this result. I mean, this was the most frequent one. And the second one, very important, was basically having access to sufficient funding for, gardening, for, for the gardens. So um, those gardens that um, felt they were relatively successful, that, that developed, that, that thrived. They were able to develop funding strategies. They, um, they explored 
um, a diversity of pathways to different ways of getting funding. Sometimes they got support as well from other organizations. Sometimes they were part of uh, umbrella organizations. Um, some of them had non-for-profit status, which helped them as well. And on the other side, barriers were really like lack of secure permanent funding, um, depending on, on uh, too much on public funding as well, because public funding, you know, it's, it comes and goes, but uh, um, having this as the only source uh, is not a good strategy for community gardens, because it's, it's often limited, uh, there are often limited public resources, which is a big um, barrier as well. So um, I'll just share my screen with you. So those were the two most frequently mentioned um, uh, topics really within the social, cultural and economic um, categories um, in terms of barriers and enablers, which we found. Um, there was another one um, which seemed to be quite important, which was around leadership and governance of the gardens. So um, there were um, there are different models of how gardens are managed basically or, or or governed and depending on the form of governance and also the kind of leadership that is provided by certain gardeners there um, that was either then perceived as an enabler or barrier so if the form of governance was perceived adequate, if there was a dedicated leadership, if they had a, um, a motivated steering committee, for example, and if they approached really governance and leadership in a professional way, that paid normally off, that, that really like um, helped in the development of the garden. At, on the barrier side, um, lack of leadership, and conflicts, particularly between gardeners and, for example, the steering committee, um, certain uh, um, or certain um, people on the committee, um, and general issues with coordination, with management of garden, um, lack of communication, and sometimes even a lack of control, because umbrella organizations have sometimes a big say. Um, uh, for example, trusts. Sometimes gardens are run by a trust, and and whatever decision needs to be made has to be um, has to be approved uh, by um, um, this higher organizations which sometimes can be frustrating for for um, for the gardeners because they don't they can't act as quickly as they probably wish to so all of those things as well um, have been mentioned as, as either enablers or barriers and this is a really interesting um, topic as well because it hasn't been um, um, it has changed in recent years, but when we did, there was another paper, when we did a paper on governance, there was, again, there was not much really in terms of community garden uh, governance. And this is a topic which we would like to um, address again now as well um, in the future um, to see basically how um, leadership and governance, that particular topic uh, in the context of community gardens has evolved in recent years. So we stopped about probably about 2016, 17. So a lot of things have happened since then. So we 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 would like to catch up on that on that topic again and see if there is any um, sort of movement going on and if um, if some of those issues which we detected have been um, addressed by other researchers in the in the literature. Andreas, thank you so much for sharing all this and uh, yeah best 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 of luck with your further works thank you and be in touch thank you very much